Hi, welcome to the EEV blog, an electronics engineering video blog of interest to anyone involved in electronics design. I'm your host, Dave Jones. Hi, it's product teardown time and it's another oscilloscope. Just so happened to have this Tektronics TDS2024C. It's not a new scope, it's a, it's a reasonably old model and no, I'm not going to review it because I don't think it's worthy. I'm not going to bother. I'm only going to do a teardown. Now, the reason for that is because it just reminds me of the old TDS 210 oscilloscope. Not that there was anything wrong with that. Great oscilloscope in its day. Pioneering, it practically started the entire digital storage oscilloscope business. All these bench portable ones anyway, the ones that had real-time sampling. They started it all, but quite frankly, I had one of those back in, I think it was 1997. I'm not kidding, not 2007, 1997. And it just reminds me of that. Sure, it's got a few more features, but the thing is, it's only got, and here's the spec, 2.5 kilobytes of sample memory. That's not megabytes, that's kilobytes. It's barely enough to do a couple of screens worth. It's hopeless. Now, where is the advancement of the art in the sample memory depth? Exactly the same 2.5K Sample memory, I can't believe it. This is, you know, Tektronix's current model and it's just not competitive. It's crazy in terms of sample memory. It's not a bad scope, you know. I can picture it being useful for say the tech fanboys or uh, something like that and you only want a basic scope that just displays a waveform on the screen and that's it. Well, okay, maybe, but Geez, I don't know, it's not very competitive. So don't expect a review of this thing. I don't think it's really worthy, but we're gonna tear it down because I'm quite curious to see what's inside. Let's go. Just one thing, don't confuse this TDS series with the DPO 2000 series or the MSO 2000 series. They're a different higher end technology scope. They cost a lot more. They've got the sample memory, they've got everything else, but this is the TDS series. All right, I know some people are going to want a little quick summary of it, really. It's quite small and uh, lightweight. So, you know, as you'd expect, it's a reasonably good quality being uh, Tektronix, one of the big names in the business, and it is fanless too. It doesn't make a sound, doesn't generate a sound. It is much lighter weight than, say, the uh, reference Rigol here. It's about the same uh, width. It is uh, not as deep as the Rigol unit, but it certainly does weigh a fair bit less, but it takes forever to boot up. It takes like 30 or 35 seconds. Crazy. On the back here, we've got a single USB uh, port to connect to the PC for control. And on the front, we've got a USB memory stick. Uh, it's got uh, a fair few more controls in the original uh, TDS uh, 200 series or the uh, or the even the new uh, Tektronix TDS 1000 series which actually replaced the uh, 200 series this is actually another reason why I'm disappointed by the 2.5k of sample memory because it's not like this is the TDS 1000 series this is the supposedly the next step up the TDS 2000 series and oh, God, 2.5k memory it's crazy anyway it's pretty bland looking actually um the just the color and the styles of the control layouts it's like a it's almost like it's a prototype or something it's like they you know they the industrial design people just didn't really finish it off and um you know the knobs aren't bad the uh the button presses they're all reasonably uh quali reasonably good quality as you'd expect but none of the buttons are pushable they've got no secondary uh, push function on them, which is quite disappointing, but there's extensive uh, menu systems. It works uh, identically to the original, um, to the standard Tektronix kind of interface, and well, that's about it. Bit underwhelmed, really. One thing I don't like with the interface on this thing is this knob over here. Look, you would think that that was a fifth uh, analog input channel, but it's not. There's the ex that's the external trigger, and this, believe it or not, is the horizontal control. It's crazy. Why are all these knobs exactly the same? These four, make them the same, fine, but the horizontal, you've got to make it bigger, and don't put it in the same line like that. That's just crazy uh, interface layout design. I don't like it. You would think that this one up here might be your uh, horizontal or something like that, but no, that's your typical soft um, soft control uh, knob, but and it's exactly the same style, shape, and color as all the rest. 
The layout is just, I don't know. Who did this? The work experience student? Eh, enough of looking at the scope. Let's take it apart. Much more interesting. Now I've got to say that is by far the easiest scope I think I've ever taken apart. A couple of uh, T10 Torx screws there, just take the button off with a pair of uh, pliers. You've got to use the rag there as you saw just so that you don't mark the uh, knob. But apart from that, it, was, uh, it came apart beautifully and here's the inside of the scope. I'm actually surprised to see two boards here. We've got a uh, board on the back which clearly drives the display we'll take a look at that and the main baseboard down the bottom here and a very nice looking uh, power supply from Emerson Networks I like it let's take a look at the Emerson power supply here each board is uh, individually serial number it looks like uses high quality components high quality uh, build I really like it um, you get a sense of a real, a real big sense of quality uh, with this thing. They've got the Celastic uh, around all the major uh, components in there. They've dobbed the Celastic in just so uh, things don't move. I really like it. It uh, uses, yes, it does actually use a real clunking mechanical uh, mains power switch there. And we'll actually uh, check that. It actually draws nothing when you uh, switch when you actually switch the thing off we got uh, caught with that with the Agilent scopes they were a bit uh, dodgy in that respect drawing six watts crazy anyway this one draws uh, zero and it's just quite a nice supply it's well laid out you can see the high voltage um, isolation slots down in there really quite a nice build single-sided of course um, they still do these boards single-sided because they're actually cheaper to manufacture. You can save a few uh, cents by doing that. There's a couple of links in there, but they've laid it out quite well to avoid the links. So it looks like a really good quality power supply with uh, what looks like decent quality components. And they've used 105 degree C uh, Rubicon brand caps. And as you can imagine, they would be uh, genuine. They wouldn't be rip off ones. Tektronix would make sure they uh, source their components from uh, quality, from the original manufacturers. We've got uh, reefer um, uh, mains class uh, mains class capacitors there. About the, really the only thing I don't really like is the um, is the soldered in um, M205 fuse in there. Why couldn't they have just put a socket in there? So if it does blow, well, you can just replace it. It I don't know. I didn't like. It. And if you notice these three TO220 packages on the same uh, heatsink here, they don't actually use any mounting hardware. No screws. Or anything like that uh, they're actually uh, stuck on with just an an adhesive uh, thermal tape and that's um that's reasonably common as opposed to say uh, this traditional uh, to 220 device down here which is which is actually uh, strapped onto its heatsink with one of those metal uh, bracket straps in there and it's got decent MOV protection on the mains input as well for surges and here's a good design aspect to show that they were really thinking the the mains IEC input connector here sure it's a PCB mount one which actually saves you on the wiring which is quite nice but a lot of people make the mistake of not physically reinforcing that properly they just rely on the PCB mount itself but this one is actually you can see the two screws there actually screw into their own uh, standoffs fixed uh, welded in standoffs on the metal chassis so they take all the stress when the user actually plugs uh, plugs in and disconnects the IEC mains connector on the top here because if you didn't have those standoffs then uh, when, when the user plugs in the uh, mains plug into the top like that all of the stress will be transferred onto the PCB and ultimately to the solder joints and flexor board and all that sort of stuff but when you add those um, fixed anchors like that you take away all that problem so they were definitely thinking 
Now, curiously, we have this two board construction. I find that rather unusual. Uh, I expected a single board construction for a scope like this, just to, uh, just to reduce the complexity. Because as you can see, you've got to have this uh, wiring loom going across here, which is an extra strip, step, extra cost. You've got to buy decent quality connectors. You've got to put these ferrite uh, beads in here as they've done. You've got to uh, add manual steps to actually cable tie the things down. It just adds a fair bit of complexity there and they've got another one over here which is again cable tied there's no ferrite um, beads on that so obviously this because it's got the ferrite uh, beads on here that means that that's actually transferring all of the uh, high frequency uh, the high frequency data for for the display um, itself so it's going from the main processor on the main board down here up to this uh, FPGA and uh, and display memory up on this board so let's take a closer look at that so here's the display board and uh, not terribly surprising at all apart from that they have actually mounted it on a separate um, board in itself it's got a Xilinx uh, Spartan 3 FPGA no surprises there with its own display memory from IDT uh, no surprises there at all uh, this is obviously a uh, DC to DC converter that goes up there and that goes off to presumably drive the uh, display backlight, the high voltage uh, backlight. And uh, there's probably a DC to DC converter there, which uh, powers um, some of the core in the FPGA. I'm sure they most likely don't get the uh, core voltage directly from the main board. And really, that's about uh, all you'd expect. That's probably the, um, the boot up um, the flash for the uh, Xilinx Spartan and not much else really. And there you go, we've taken off the uh, front panel assembly. I had to remove all the knobs there and a couple of screws on the back, but it all came a, a, apart fairly easily. And there's the uh, membrane um, uh, rubberized uh, keypad on the front. That, that can just uh, pop out if you want it to, where they've got uh, two contacts per, um, per switch for reliability, I am presuming. And that's just all one big molded piece. And then we have the main board here which uh, has all the rotary encoder knobs on it and uh, that looks quite nice. And here's our main board. Let's take a look at it. The first thing I notice is that the um, analog input circuitry doesn't have a complete metal shield on it. It's only got these uh, these little uh, shielding uh, walls here like that around part of that. Now most, um, this is a 200 megahertz analog scope, so most um, scopes in that category will have, even lower end categories, will have a metal can there so i'm not sure why they've actually done that i guess they deem it not they don't actually require it anyway uh let's take a look at um some more aspects of it. there's two main asics up here clearly because it's a four i i presume they're asic i don't actually recognize the uh number of them at all it's a vo42 adg522 i don't really know that it doesn't uh, ring a bell but they've got some, uh, they've obviously got some, uh, that looks like uh, DRAM there. They've got some um, high-speed IDT memory there and there. And the analog input 
parts are national uh, semiconductor parts. Now, uh, curiously, here's the uh, battery for the real-time clock. And look, they've got a really um, <laughs> an old-fashioned uh, SO package uh, real-time Dallas semiconductor real-time clock over here. It's quite nice uh, compared to most of the stuff, although you've got some um, standard SO packages over here. But um, some of the stuff is, uh, you know, reasonably um, old-school uh, packaging. And now let's take a look at the analog input circuitry here. Now we've got uh, two national semiconductor parts. I don't know those offhand. Um, I'd have to look those up, whether or not they're custom or they're um, off the shelf, off, off the shelf devices. Now, um, this one is a 200 megahertz bandwidth, but there are uh, lower models, so I'm not sure. I presume it's only a uh, software difference, like in the Rigols and many other scopes on the market to actually uh, get the different bandwidths or possibly the 200 megahertz one might be different to the 100 megahertz model or something like that perhaps and obviously and obviously the other channel is exactly identical we've got some uh, trigger well there's not much in the way of uh, trigger circuitry over here for the external uh, trigger device and uh, there's a close-up of the main one of the main uh, ASIC devices there and uh, they've got this expansion header up here and I'm not sure what that's uh, doing and whether or not that's for some um, I don't know logic and mixed signal version I'm not sure they don't have a mixed signal version in the 2000 uh, series so go figure I'm not sure what's going on here um, this looks like a uh, processor for the USB and perhaps uh, for the whole unit itself uh, itself to see that I'd have to actually take uh, the sticker off there's the power input with a couple of freestanding voltage regulators I'm not a big fan of the freestanding TO220 package they put a probably should have put some uh, silicon on that like they did uh, for the power supply they've got a uh, Cypress uh, semiconductor part here I believe that's for the uh, USB um, host down here for the USB key uh, that's the uh, that's the uh, scope uh, probe um, compensation uh, pin there and really there's not much else pretty typical of what you'd expect to find in one of these uh, low-end scopes most of the magic is done inside these ASICs here there's actually presumably they're identical chips so there's there's presumably one per uh, two channels like that so if you bought the two channel one I'm sure they would just uh, depopulate all of the uh, analog parts that extra memory and that uh, ASIC over there so the two channel would be nearly identical to this just some uh, cost saving now and if we flip it over and take a look at the bottom side of the board here, let's take a look at what we've got. Unsurprisingly, there's the uh, firmware. It's a dead giveaway. That's the flash chip because it's got the firmware sticker on it. Um, and this device here is a uh, free scale. There we go. Is that a 68,000? That looks like an MC68000 device to me, which... Um, I think, if memory serves me correctly, the original TDS series scopes might have used a 68,000 processor, so they may have carried that over. I will have to double check that, but uh, there you go. And somehow it's connected into, um, well, it's connected into all of the uh, stuff behind there, those two big um, ASIC devices up there, as you can see, they're directly on the top there because you can see all the uh, vias connecting the bottom of of those BGA devices there and smack in the middle of it is that Freescale processor now uh, over here there's a TI part I don't recognize that one offhand um, there's some serpentine uh, traces going down there uh, differential pairs obviously something to do with the let's have a look I don't know something to do with the USB perhaps up there I'm not sure and there's some uh, shielding um, sections like this on the base of both of the analog channels but apart from that not much else on the bottom not much doing there and if we pull this chips pants down let's take a look our Tira Max 2 P CPLD there you go some nice attention to detail here for the backup battery there they've actually covered the bottom pins with a Celastic so that you can't short it out uh, to the chassis I presume when you're installing it or when you're servicing it very nice 
And the top switchboard up here with all the rotor encoders looks like it has a couple of its own processors on there. I'm not going to bother to take that board out. It's uh, not uh, terribly exciting at all. Uh, but it looks like uh, Tektronix have put firmware stickers on all their programmable devices. So that's a dead giveaway um, of the devices that actually have um, uh, firmware or something else built into them. And does it work? Unfortunately, we can't tell because the damn thing takes about 30 seconds to boot up. Crazy. Eh, at least the screen's going. There you go. Still going. Come on. Hey, we're up. There we go. She works. Beauty. See you next time. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and do all that sort of stuff.